These professional chefs all want to break into the top ranks of the world's culinary elite. Deciding who has the talent to cut it is MasterChef judge Greg Wallace. That cream with the Calvados, it is delicious. And culinary legend Michelle Rue Jr. With two Michelin stars, he's expecting perfection. It certainly isn't what I would expect in a high-end restaurant. Cooking doesn't get better than this. Matthew, Steve, Jamie and Daniel have made it through to the quarter-final. Today, they face only one daunting challenge. These chefs are here on merit. They have earned their place so far today. Now they have to prove it all over again. The last round was quite tough, but getting through gives you a little bit of a buzz. And hopefully I can bring that through to this round. Today I'm feeling excited, nervous, anxious, keen. I just want to get in there and show them what I can do. It's very exciting to get to this stage and to be so close to the semi-finals. Just determined to get through today now. I'm really excited, really looking forward to the competition, but at the same time, I'm an absolute nervous wreck. They want to line up with the culinary elite. If they are serious, they need to perform today. You now are preparing your own dishes. Not just for us, the judges, but for professional restaurant critics. You get through this and a whole adventure begins. Cooking at this level is never easy. And cooking for restaurant critics is even tougher. Do yourselves proud. Do us proud. Semi-final place awaits. Off you go. In exactly an hour and a half, the chefs will have to serve a three-course menu that represents the very best of their cooking. There are going to be times in their career where they simply have to deliver. Today is one of those days. Cooking for a restaurant critic always gives me the butterflies. Critics can be really nasty. They can make or break you. Originally, I got into cooking because I wanted something as a backup to... I was going to join the fire brigade. But once I got in the kitchen, it just took over my life. I found that I really enjoyed it more than anything else. And since then, I just haven't looked back and can't really see myself doing anything else. Steve has got natural talent. He's got a good eye for presentation and he understands great taste. He has the ability to take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. That ballotine of rabbit was an absolute dream. You should be very, very pleased with yourself. Steve has proven to us that he can cook, and he can cook really well. The whole thing is bordering on perfect. You've put the pancake around the salmon there. At my restaurant, I would want it to be cooked like that. We didn't ask him to make a pancake. He did that off his own back. That shows to me a clever chef. But. There is a danger that he might push himself just a little too hard today. I hope he's not attempting the unachievable. Can you tell us what your menu is? Uh, it's a warm salad of scallops and smoked eel, and can of lamb, smoked aubergine puree, and then rhubarb and ginger cheesecake for dessert. What would you say to a critic that suggested a cheesecake was far too simple? It's not a standard cheesecake. It's, a, it's been deconstructed. <laughs> have you ever cooked, or have you ever knowingly cooked for restaurant critics? Uh, a couple of times. Well, that's cooking someone else's food and under, <laughs> as part of a team, so 
responsibility is shared in that respect. <laughs> yeah. Today it's all on me. Exactly. There's no hiding now, isn't it? It's Steve's cooking on show. Fingers crossed. Steve's cooking his rhubarb under vacuum in a plastic pouch. He's also cooking his lamb, again in a plastic pouch, sous vide, vacuum packed. That's great modern cooking techniques. You give me a rhubarb cheesecake anyway, I'm happy. But a deconstructed one, I'm absolutely fascinated. I think it would be a massive achievement if I could win this. Uh, something I could be really proud of and hopefully a leg up in the air in my career, so it would be amazing. When I won my heat, it was a big relief. I'm glad I'm free to the cup final. I can see myself going all the way now. Let's go, let's win. I'm very excited about Jamie. Crying out loud, that guy has skill and taste buds in abundance. I doubted whether the sea bass would work in the niçoise. It does work. Absolutely lovely. That salad niçoise, I thought, was a treat. But he made a sea bass fillet and buttery soft potatoes, and for some maddening reason, put an orange salad at the end of it. Potato and orange shouldn't be on the same plate. No. There is that dangerous streak in him. That really does scare me. If he does that for the food critics, then they will see it and they will laugh at him. As a chef, I do like putting twists on things. Just to, just to keep it interesting. Today, there's nothing too crazy, but I'm not playing it safe. I think if one were to just come together today, I think I can put them away. Jamie, you have a huge amount of ingredients on here. Tell me what your menu is. Uh, starter of smoked trout with watercress salad. Trout, cooked myself. Followed by pot roast pheasant. Then for dessert, honey, set cream, rhubarb jelly, and rhubarb sherbet. The only thing I'm worried about is if my jelly sets in time. If, um, I think it will. Or if I know it will. Are we going to get um, something as uh, far out as orange and potatoes? <laughs> Not this time, I'm afraid, no. Oh, Jamie, I'm so glad to hear it. Jamie, as usual, has got a big smile on his face. But I fear for his dessert being set on time. He's only just put it in the fridge. Will it set? <clears throat> when I told my family that I got through to the quarterfinals, they were over the moon. They were really proud of me. And my girlfriend is so happy, she was screaming down the phone. It's a good feeling knowing that I've got so much support with my family and friends. Daniel is a truly gifted, talented cook. He obviously understands great taste, but Dan's presentation sometimes lets him down. The tastes and the flavours are fine dining, but the presentation is, is definitely not there. I think your flavour combinations are great. As long as I can eat your dish blindfolded, I think I was being served very well. What I want to see from Daniel today is being able to put presentation and taste in one plate. I think Michelle and Greg already know my passion for the kitchen. They already seen how happy I am when I'm when I'm cooking. I'm out to win. Second best wouldn't be good enough for me. If I did get knocked out, I'd be absolutely devastated because I've got it in my in my head and in my heart now that I want to win this competition. All right, Daniel. Yep, I'm well, thank you. Good. What are you cooking for us? Today, for a start, I'm doing steamed sea bass with lemon and vanilla. And um, for main course, you're getting a roast venison loin. And then for a dessert, you're getting apple tart to tan and caramel sauce. What's going to wow the critics? Hopefully, the presentation will go on my side this time. Um, I've planned the menu. I know how I'm going to present things, so hopefully I can actually get my ideas onto the plate and present it to yourself and the critics. Mmm. <laughs> Tatan with caramel sauce. They are gonna go mental over it. But what's going on with the sea bass, vanilla, and garlic? I think that that could well be a step too far. Matthew, 
is a very knowledgeable young chef. He understands the basics really well. Somerset-born Matthew proved he had real skill in his heat. Nice. Really nice. Very good Bernays. Soft, moist beef. Well done. But he could be very heavy-handed. Beetroot and horseradish cream is delicious. It absolutely annihilates the fish, though. It is pointless cooking a piece of fish to perfection if you are going to get the flavourings wrong. He needs to understand combinations of flavours and textures. If he can grasp that, then he could go all the way. In the past rounds, obviously, I've had mistakes and things have gone not quite to plan for me. Hopefully, today, I can raise my game and uh, everybody will be happy. Tell me what your menu is. Beetroot, cured rhubarb and blood orange salad with goat's cheese. Then main course will be the roasted squad pigeon with raviolo of uh, wild mushroom. And pudding? And pudding will be carpaccio, pineapple, uh, coconut jelly and passion fruit sorbet. How is this going to really impress us and the critics? It's the taste that you're looking for, the, the combination of flavours all marrying together. You seem a lot more lively today, a lot more confident. Tell me what's happened to you. Well, if I'm not confident, I'm not going to get anywhere, so that's the way I'm looking at it today. I am a bit worried myself about the flavour combinations going on in the starter. This cured rhubarb, some beetroot, orange dressing and some goat's cheese. It, to me, it just sounds a bit bizarre, a bit odd. Today, cooking my own food for the critics, um, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm really hoping that I get a seal of approval from them and they enjoy what I've got to give them. It's 20 minutes before service and the critics arrive. Charles Campion is the restaurant critic for the Evening Standard. I eat out about four or five times a week. Finding really top-rate food is very difficult. William Sitwell is the editor of Waitrose Food Illustrated. It's an old cliche, but chefs must always remember that simplicity is the most important thing, and that's what I look for in good food. Kate Spicer writes for the Sunday Times. I eat out up to three times a day. For me, what makes a really great dish is that it's made with a skill and honesty and love. Cooking for the food critics. I don't think it gets much tougher than that. This is probably the hardest day of their career so far. What have we got in store today, professionals? Hmm. First to face the critics is Steve. Are you going to be able to place up on time? A little bit behind overall, but um, I think so. We can't have the first one up late, Steve. It's going to knock the whole thing back. You've got 60 seconds to go. If you're quick, you'll do it. We're on time, let's go. Twenty-eight-year-old Steve has made a starter of warm salad of scallop, smoked eel, watercress and apple puree. I hate it when people describe something as a salad and you get less watercress than you could put in your buttonhole. I resent being offered smoked eel and then having it under a teaspoonful. It wasn't able to actually even compete with a scallop because it disappeared. I don't feel that the, the flavours work together in harmony. The sweetness of the scallops doesn't benefit in any way from the sort of tart apple. It really doesn't set the beginning of the three-course meal alight. The scallops are nicely cooked. It's a nice starter, but nothing more. I'm not convinced by apple and scallop. I'm disappointed with it. I'm hoping the critics won't be. 
you have five minutes now to get this main out. There's nothing in that main course that worries me. No. Lamb, garlic, thyme, aubergine. It seems pretty straightforward, but, but you know, who knows? <laughs> Are you going to get these out? Fingers crossed. Be careful. Steve's used modern cooking techniques to make his main course of cannon of lamb cooked sous vide or under vacuum with smoked aubergine puree, wild garlic leaves, and thyme jus. I actually rather like that lamb. I think it's been cooked with great subtlety. Um, to me, it's just right. Um, the wild garlic leaves are quite fresh and tasty. I think the pureed aubergine is under seasoned, under smoked. I actually don't mind that, that um, the aubergine paste. The ingredients do all work well together. The idea is good. That aubergine puree is quite tasty. I quite enjoy that. The jus is really nice, good balance to it. Lamb tastes nice, it's nicely seasoned. It's tasty, yeah, it's good. Steve, you've now got five minutes to get your dessert up. Two minutes, Steve, please. Well done. Super. I hope it's a baked cheesecake, because that's mm. my favourite. Steve's also designed his dessert to show a knowledge of modern cooking. He's made a deconstructed rhubarb and ginger cheesecake, comprising of sous vide cooked rhubarb, ginger shortbread, and vanilla cream cheese. The rhubarb's quite nice being sharp. The, the crunchy shortbread base and the rhubarb work really well together. I think that cream is wonderfully sweet. The flavour's there. I mean, that pudding, actually, I thought was delicious. Steve has obviously got a certain amount of good technical ability there. The cream cheese is really light and he's made a beautiful canal of it. The rhubarb has still got a bit of a bite to it, but it's sweet enough. It's a nice dessert, though. I like it. It was my menu, my chance to shine, my chance to impress everybody. I feel like I could have cooked a lot better. There's every chance I could be going home, which is not what I want at all. A little under five minutes now. Are you going to get these out, Jamie? Yeah. Good, good, good. Last 60 seconds, please. Jamie, get that presentation right. Let's go, let's go. Well Come done. On. Come on. Dad of one Jamie's gone for classic flavour combinations in his starter of hot smoked trout with celeriac and apple remoulade and a salad with grain mustard dressing. Celeriac remoulade is one of the great joys of life. It just doesn't seem to work terribly well in this instance. This is just grated celeriac and apple that has sort of kissed the mayonnaise bottle. That fish has got a horrible texture to it. It's got nasty flavour. I just think this is dreadful. The salady bit, very nice little salady bit. <laughs> I don't see how the remoulade and the smoky fish and the salad actually work together. To me, it doesn't scream out, it's fine dining. 
five minutes, Jamie. We want these mains up. You're never going to get this out in four minutes, Jamie, are you? Maybe a minute more. Last 60 seconds. Time's up. Come on, Jamie, there's a timing issue here. You haven't got time to mess about. Come on. Get it out. Wipe those plates and let's go. Despite being late, Jamie hopes his pot roast pheasant with a parsnip fritter, cabbage, and a sultana and beer sauce will prove he understands fine dining. The pheasant itself, it's fairly chewy and it's fairly dry. As to the beer sauce, he's obviously scared of beer. He's over reduced to the point where it's a syrup, then you are left with the sweetness and the bitterness of the hops. It would have interested me if that parsnip fritter was a parsnip fritter. It's not. It's a potato fritter with a bit of parsnip in it, and you can barely taste it, which I think is hugely disappointing. It's lacking a bit of sauce. The croquette is ginormous. I just wish he could have done something about smartening up that plate. It certainly isn't what I would expect in a high-end restaurant. Six minutes, Jamie, six minutes. Are we going to get this one out on time? Yep. The pudding, set honey cream with rhubarb jelly. Sounds very nice. Rhubarb and custard sherbet. That could be good, but we'll have to wait and see. Good luck, Jamie. Jamie now needs to produce a perfect dessert. We've got four minutes. But will his honey cream and rhubarb jelly be set? <laughs> Yay! Good on ya. Well done. Good, Jamie. Well Very up. good. Knock him dead. Go on. It's Jamie's last chance to impress the critics. He's made a set honey cream and rhubarb jelly, stewed rhubarb, and has added a twist a rhubarb and custard sherbet made from boiled sweets. Puddings are meant to be sweet, right? The top of this jelly is as sour as rhubarb before it's even cooked. It's got that really acidic, bitter quality in my mouth. That rhubarb totally lacks any sweetness, and I can't eat it. This cream, again, it's not sweet. There is nothing sweet about this plate of food apart from the ground-up, cheap, boiled sweet down the middle. I think we're getting carried away. It's not a complete disaster. The actual technique in the kitchen, the skills employed, were fine. The whole dessert is lacking in sweetness. It's rhubarb, and then it's just milk. I was shaking, I was nervous, I was a bit frightened. But that's got to be the most nerve-wracking hour and a half of my life. <laughs> Next to cook is Daniel, who needs to prove he can deliver on presentation as well as flavour. Three minutes, Daniel. Yep. Three minutes. Presentation, focus on what you're doing, eh? It's looking good. If that sea bass with lemon and vanilla goes wrong, it's it's gonna be stomach turning. In the right hand, fantastic. In, with someone who hasn't quite got enough know-how, it could be catastrophe. Let's move. Come on, come on, come on. Off you go. Well yeah. done.
Daniel's starter is steamed sea bass scented with lemon and vanilla on green beans with caviar, confit of garlic and a garlic and cream sauce. It looks incredibly professional. There's a wonderful, delicate balance of colour. It's definitely the best presented dish we've had so far. He's shown a lot of great technique. I think it's very difficult to cook a piece of fish as perfectly as this, and I think he's absolutely nailed it. I would agree, there is, there is a lot of skill, but the sauce is like a very creamy custard. I have not got many problems with the sauce, and the little bits of caviar work terribly well. Good to look at, good to eat. I actually quite like this, it does look nice, it looks dainty. I like the almost sweetness the vanilla brings to that fish. That works for me because they're both light. Daniel, listen, you have seven minutes. With time running out to cook his main course, disaster strikes. Daniel. Yep. You've burnt your sauce. Yep. Do you have time to make another one? Um, I'm not going to have time to do it the way I wanted it to. I'm just going to have to make do with what I get. Uh, it's a stupid mistake I've burnt it. You can do this. Just two minutes, come on. Come on, presentation. Keep it neat, tidy. Where's our makeshift sauce? Okay, Daniel, come on, let's go. Well done. With seconds to spare, Daniel has remade his port and red currant jelly sauce to go with his loin of venison on spinach, with fried potato cake and roasted root vegetables. There is nothing wrong with the shape of a carrot. There's nothing wrong with beetroot in their natural state. You know, to cube them, it doesn't work. What it does show is an eye for colour and, and some imagination. He's done that piece of venison, I think, great justice. And I like the potato and the spinach with it. I think the jus is quite good. It's got a sharpness to it that goes well. Anyone who can make a potato cake like this is generally a good fellow. Um, I notice you've finished yours. <laughs> that sauce is not as rich and deep as it should be, but it's hardly surprising seeing as that's the second one he knocked up with minutes to go. I like the dish. That really is not far off for me. After being forced to serve a rushed sauce, Daniel's taking his time on his dessert. And his tart tatins are only just going into the oven. I love a tart tatin. Difficult thing to cook because people know what it should be like and therefore it's got to be right. Are the uh, tatins cooked? Not quite, no. I'm going to be pushing for time, actually. Well, your time's up in three minutes. How long are you going to need for that? Probably some another three or four minutes in the oven and then a minute to plate up as well. Well, you better go and explain that to the critics. Really sorry, but I'm going to have to delay by about two minutes on the tartar tans and not quite there in the oven. You're one minute over. That's all right. Go. Well done, Daniel. For dessert, Daniel has made apple tart tatin with Calvados creme fraiche and caramel sauce. Uh, it is really disappointing. Half of this pastry is completely undercooked. A couple of minutes late, but it's still 15 minutes short of being cooked. Oh, dear. What a pity. I mean, it's really disappointing because he's got all the components right. This toffee-flavoured syrupy sauce it's really nice and goes beautifully with the creme fraiche. This toffee goo is undeniably fantastic. I think that in the grand scheme of things, Daniel's failings are small and can be easily rectified. The apple should be full of buttery caramel flavour, and it's just not. 
with the mixture of the caramel sauce and that cream with the Calvados. It is delicious. I am very tough on myself all the time. I do actually strive for perfection. I was nowhere near perfect out there today. Just not happy with myself, basically. Um, but hopefully the judges might see it differently. Last to serve the critics is Matthew, who's starting with a beetroot, orange and goat's cheese salad. I mean, it's just bananas, that starter. In fact, bananas are the only ingredient he hasn't <laughs> put, put in the starter. You've only got three minutes, Matthew. Are you going to do it? Um, yeah. What have you got left to do? Segment the orange, mix it with the salad, crumble the goat's cheese. And put it on the plate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Done. Come on, time up, so please. One minute. You're one minute over and counting. Can they go? You're two minutes over now. Two minutes over. Come on. Come on, Matthew. Is that it? Take them. Don't forget to say sorry, huh? Don't forget to apologise. Sincere apologies for the delay. Somerset-born Matthew's hoping he's balanced the flavours in his starter of beetroot, cured rhubarb and blood orange salad with goat's cheese. The rhubarb... The chunks are too big, it's, it reeks of vinegar. The goat's cheese, rather than helping the beetroot, makes it taste even more disgusting. Here are four flavours. They don't work together, and they all wish they were in a different pot in the kitchen somewhere. I think Matthew is a great chef in what? a parallel universe <laughs> where these flavours really work. <laughs> He's turned out a real honker. It's hardly showcasing a chef's culinary skills, is it? It's beetroot and orange and rhubarb with cheese on top. Matthew now needs to prove to Michelle he deserves his quarter-final place with his pigeon and raviolo main. Have you started on the raviolo yet? That's what I'm starting next. You've got enough time for it? I believe so, yeah. He's only just started the raviolo. I'm a bit worried on timing issues here. Matthew, you're supposed to be serving this main in three minutes. You're up against it, mate, aren't you? I am indeed, yeah. How long's the ravioli gonna take to cook? Two minutes. Two minutes once they're made, though. You better stop right now and go out and tell them how long you're gonna be and be realistic, please. I'm extremely sorry, but I'm going to need an extra five minutes on the main course. My apologies. For goodness sake, if it's five minutes late and it's edible, that's a really big step forward. Come on, Matthew. We, we, this, this is just out of order, isn't it? You're eight minutes late. Come on, let's, let's get this together, shall we? Yeah. Good. OK. Can they go? Yeah. Right, we are nine minutes late, Matthew. Let's get it out there, please. Very, very, very sorry. Sorry for the He's made roast squab pigeon with celeriac puree, wilted spinach, and a raviolo of wild mushroom and pigeon liver, and a port reduction. I think this is much more promising. It's quite a good dish. I mean, I think that the pigeon is about accurately cooked. This pigeon's good and works well with the celeriac. I actually quite like the celeriac, along with the spinach. In with the mushrooms and the ravioli, raviolo, he's put the pigeon's livers. I like the way he's used his imagination. It's a colossal improvement on the starter. This dish is rushed. I mean, why would you be nine minutes late? You didn't even have to cook the starter. Carpaccio of pineapple, coconut jelly and passion fruit sorbet. This is a man who knows how to cure rhubarb, so God knows what he can do to a pineapple. <laughs> can we get this one out on time? We've got two minutes.
Nice. That's really nice. Come on, keep a steady hand, keep it going. Sunshine on a plate. Right, well done. Well done, come on, well done. For dessert, Matthews made carpaccio of pineapple, coconut jelly and passion fruit sorbet. I love this. I think it's absolutely delicious. It's got really zingy flavours. I love this coconut jelly. I mm. really like it. It tastes of suntan lotion in a really good way. It's a real innovation, really clever to have done that. It's a very agreeable pudding. Very, very refreshing, these are full of Caribbean sunshine. A combination of flavours are spot on. It's a nice way to finish a meal. I don't necessarily think I was over ambitious with the ideas. I think the time limit was something that I should have really addressed. You need to have in your heart of hearts that everything's spot on. Um, I'm not quite feeling that way at the moment, to be honest. So, guys, what do you really think of our four chefs? Pretty mixed bag, I think. It, it did seem to vary quite a lot. Daniel has got some good techniques and good talent. His sea bass was cooked perfectly. Of all the dishes, I think it looked the most professional. But he just, you know, been a bit of a ponce when it came to the vegetables. I really liked Steve's menu. One course led on to the other. Steve's rhubarb and ginger cheesecake, even though it wasn't a cheesecake, I actually thought it was absolutely delicious. I love the sound of Jamie's menu, but every single dish fell flat on its face. The actual technique in the kitchen, the way things were done, the skills employed, were fine. But I tell Matthew, don't ever, ever try and cook a dish like the beetroot, cured rhubarb, blood orange salad and goat's cheese again in your life. Forget it. Don't even talk about it. After this appalling starter, his next two dishes for me were quite good. A lot of them have potential. A little bit of hand-holding, a little bit of mentoring, and, you know, these guys could, could go somewhere. Charles Campion was right when he said that was a mixed bag. To get two to go through from these four, it's going to be very, very tough. I'd like to start with Daniel. He had delivered us flavour in the previous rounds, and we said to him, you need to give us finesse. He gave us a sea bass, very nicely cooked, but what most impressed me was his presentation. That was the kind of plate of food that you would expect in a top restaurant. He gave us a lovely venison. His cubes of root vegetables, I can understand why he did that, to pretty up the plate a bit. He gave us a tatatan. We had good flavourings. It looked pretty as a picture. We asked him to work on his presentation. He did just that. I think he is getting to be the genuine article. Really, really want to get through to these semi-finals. Um, be absolutely devastated if I go, go out today. I really don't want to go home. Jamie's style of cooking was revealed today, and it is good, wholesome, hearty food. I mean, that hot smoked trout, it was an OK starter. We then moved on to his pheasant. There was hardly any sauce, and what sauce there was was over-reduced and sticky and we had the most enormous croquette. It was massive. It was, I mean, it was a meal in itself. We're talking about fine dining. His pudding, I thought, was fun. Unfortunately, it was lacking in sugar. If I went home today, it would be a bit upsetting, but knowing I've came and given the best I, you know, best I could give, that's good enough for me. Matthew's an interesting character. <laughs> he got himself in a right utter tiz today, and I don't understand why because less work went into his starter than anybody else's. Main course of squab pigeon. On the menu, it read beautifully, and it's the kind of thing that I would have ordered. I love those flavours. But it was ten minutes late. His dessert, however, it was sweet, it was sharp, it was lovely. Obviously, I'd be over the moon if I do get through to the next stage, but I think I could have done a lot more. Unfortunately, what's done is done. Steve is a talented and knowledgeable chef. He understands modern cooking techniques. His knowledge is great. 
he gave us the can and the lamb. Everything on there tasted good, and that style of food would definitely be found in fine dining restaurants. I did like the cheesecake. I thought that was a fun, good dessert, and it looked the part. If I go home today, I'll be pretty gutted, to be honest, because you don't want to go away on a bad note. You want to go away knowing that you've done the best you can, and today I don't think I did. They've all done well, in parts. But who do we think can go through to the next round and maybe even lift the crown? It really is tough. Two of you are leaving us, two of you are becoming semi-finalists. The first chef going through to the next round is... Daniel. Our second chef going through to the semi-final is... Steve. That was intense. I'm feeling a little bit upset, disappointed, but, you know, I gave it my best, you know, obviously it just wasn't good enough, you know. I had a feeling that uh, I'd not performed to my full potential. I've had a bad day, I'll be honest, and you can't have bad days with competitions like this, and, uh, yeah. Getting to the semi-finals obviously puts me a step closer to realising my dream of having a restaurant with a Michelin star, which would be amazing. Such an achievement and I feel so proud of this. Brilliant, brilliant news. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Absolutely over the moon about making it to the semi-finals. It's what I came here to do. Really, really wanted to do it. And now that I'm here and I heard my name called, it's a fantastic feeling. Like, I can't wipe the smile off my face at the moment. It's great, absolutely great. Daniel and Steve will be back for the semi-finals to battle it out for the title of Professional MasterChef. <laughs>